Welcome to the Passive Income Podcast. I am Dave. Please be sure to join the Passive Income Posse by clicking that subscribe button below. i uh, super excited for this episode. Joining me is AJ Button. AJ, please go ahead and give yourself an introduction. So uh, as, as Dave said, my name is AJ and I'm a, I'm a value investor slash dividend investor. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm as dividend focused as some of the dividend accounts you see on Twitter, but I, every stock in my portfolio right now, except for Google, currently pays a dividend. And uh, I'm also a financial writer for uh, Seeking Alpha primarily and the Canadian edition of The Motley Fool, which also gets shown around on uh, Yahoo Finance and MSN Money and elsewhere. Right. So I, I've been writing about stocks and investments pretty consistently for about five years now. Before that, I was a copywriter, but I, I, I've had an interest in the stock market going back to high school. I bought my first uh, investment portfolio uh, in my last year of high school, and that was an all-dividend portfolio, actually. And um, funnily enough, I mean, I, I've never been a dividend-biased investor, but I've always ended up being primarily in dividend stocks because I find that dividends correlate with quality to a right. very large extent. And uh, so for that reason, I'm sort of a dividend investor by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a great point because I see a lot of these, um, I don't want to call them Twitter fight, X fight, whatever we're calling it mm now, uh, back and forth between like the dividend co community and the total growth investors who are saying, well, these companies, if they, if they didn't pay a dividend, then they would have that money to, you know, to put elsewhere, whether it's in, you know, paying down debt or into research and development yeah. or into any other hundreds of other places you could put that money. And, and, you know, the idea there is then if that company is improving, it's going to uh, grow the share, the price, the, the, the share, the, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, it's a debate that's been going on for a long time. And it ultimately comes down to uh, the amount of investment opportunities available to the company and how cheaply they can be financed. If you have low rates and a lot of investment opportunities, maybe, maybe it's best not to do the dividend. But if you're in an industry where, like, say, for example, banking, where uh, investment opportunities, I mean, it's hard to do deals in banking right now. Uh, a lot of them are getting shot down. And, uh, and, you know, rate, rates are pretty high right now. I mean, maybe for banks, it's probably better to pay a dividend most of the time because it's not an industry where investing huge amounts into growth is necessarily going to do anything for you. Right. Yeah. And here in Canada, too, like, it, it's, a, it's a high barrier to entry to create a new bank. Yeah. Right? Like, we is. have the big five slash big six banks. And, and a few others on top of that. There's literally only about ten banks in Canada, and yeah, and the U.S. Like, has like 4, nobody 000. can name the, those last three or four. Yeah, <laughs> the U.S. has like four thousand banks, which I just find amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So thousands of banks, a totally different story in the U.S. Where, you know, anybody, Uncle Bob and Uncle Jim, can just you know, I'm gonna, I, 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 I have this property on the corner of Fifth and Main, and I'm gonna open up a, a, a bank. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You can just be an individual. Totally different animal. And open a bank. And, I mean, that's how Bank of America started, actually. It started as the Bank of Italy and, and their founder just went door to door, knocking on people door, people's doors, offering to lend them money. That's uh, <laughs> that's an interesting. Little that's bit very interesting. And I, I, I think you can, know that. I think you can still kind of do that in the U.S. banking market. Yeah, you can still kind of just have a <laughs> work from home bank, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Unreal. Yeah. So you mentioned like high school, so probably about 18 years old or so, yeah. the last year of high school, and you started buying shares and companies and dividend, or, well, you mentioned dividend paying stocks, but you started buying like at a young age and well, super young age, really, right? Like yeah. most, most people graduating high school, you know, in grade to, say 11 or 12 are not thinking about <laughs> investing in the stock market or whatever. So I guess maybe just talk us through your mindset there in that, in that last year of high school where it's like, yeah, I'm going to get into this. Let's see what happens. Well, I, I mean, my dad was really into investing and he had a lot of investing books at home and I was, I was fairly interested in money and making a living and things like that at that age. So I, uh, I read, you know, the, uh, the intelligent investor and I read, uh, uh, common stock, a part of common stocks and uncommon profit. And I just read some things on the internet 
about Warren Buffett and all that stuff. So I bought a portfolio that was, um, it was very much a, a, like a Warren Buffett clone portfolio, although not entirely, but it had uh, Coca-Cola. So that's, you know, classic uh, Warren Buffett stock. Yeah. Johnson and Johnson, another uh, Warren Buffett stock, uh, Pfizer, which I liked because it, it was similar to Johnson and Johnson and it had a high yield at that time, I believe. Um, I also had Comcast and that was based on the Peter Lynch buy what you know principle. I was working at a Comcast call center then. And I, I knew from working there that their customers couldn't easily switch to an alternative alternate supplier. So I figured that they had a, a, a moat of sorts and I bought their stock. And uh, finally, Golar LNG, which was a natural gas company that I heard about from a, news, a newsletter guy. <laughs> and that was my, uh, I sold that one real quick though. I, I made a 30% gain on that in like no time, like a couple weeks and I just sold it. The, uh, nice. the other four that I mentioned, I held a bit longer. Nice. So with that Coca-Cola stock, are you, are you making the Warren Buffett dividends also? I, I, don't hold that million on Coke? I don't hold that portfolio any longer because because you see after uh, two years later or so, I, I sold the portfolio to pay for high school. Uh, pay, for pay, pay for college, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you're not paying for high school. Yeah, like, no. <laughs> you're getting really good grades if you are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh wow, that's a uh, that's a very interesting uh, beginning. I, I guess let's just talk through what what happens, you know, next through your college years. Are are you still looking back into or getting back into investing, or you've just taken that that money, take, taken your profits, pay for your college tuition, get through college, and that? Well, funnily enough, I I didn't get after that. I didn't get back into investing for another. Uh almost 10 years afterwards, because I, um, when I was going to university, I was, you know, borrowing money and I racked up, I, not like a, a crazy amount of debt, like some people do, uh, particularly in the States where, I mean, you can see people. Yeah. Like 100, You're like, what are you guys but doing? Like, it at, doesn't make sense. At my, at my peak, I was 13 and a half thousand dollars in debt. And I just, for, for a good few years after that, I was really focused on uh, paying that off. Right. And for that reason, uh, I mean, and some of it was credit card debt. So, like, I mean, what are the chances that uh, that your stocks are going to outperform the twenty percent you're paying on credit cards? So, I, I think I was fairly rational to not be investing in the stock market at that point. But yeah, um, it makes sense, right? Anyway, but yeah, twenty percent credit card yeah. debt. You need to get that paid off as quick as possible. Just get rid of it. Yeah. So. Um, I graduated in, uh, in 2012 and by 2018 or so I had that all paid off and, um, graduated I, college in 2018 or university. No, graduated in 2012 and I had the, the bills paid off by about 2018. Graduated so, university or college in 2012. Yeah. Just so we're okay. Yeah. And, um, so by that point, I mean, I had been doing a lot of copywriting and I had, had kind of a niche in uh, financial copywriting, which was writing, you know, sales emails and website copies and things like that for people like, you know, uh, asset managers and banks and newsletter writers and, you know, all kinds of different financial services. And um, so I, I had begun, you know, building my knowledge back up that I had sort of forgotten during my uh, uh, debt repayment years. Right. And uh, then I, I applied for a contract to write for the uh, Motley Fool. I got that. And that became kind of like all, an almost full-time thing for me because they were at, at that point, I mean, they've gotten a little bit more uh, strict about how much they let you publish now. But when I first started there, they'd let you write like as many articles as you wanted. So it was just like, you know, just sit down blogging about stocks forever and you could actually make an okay living at it. Right. But um, anyways, so that got me really into stocks and I started investing again. This was about uh, 2018, 2019 or so. And, uh, you know, when I started off, uh, it was initially just the Canadian companies that I had been covering, which I identified as being pretty good. So it was TD Bank and CN Railway, two stock portfolio at first. And as I started branching out a little bit more, I started getting a little bit into the index funds and the U.S. technology stocks. And uh, in 2021, I finally took a took a little adventure into Chinese stocks even. And I'm still I'm still holding all those uh, to this day. But yeah, so that's that's basically my investing adventure uh, so far. I, I had a portfolio that I bought in high school, held for a few years, then it went on a bit of a hiatus because I was paying off debt, and then finally got back into it in uh, late eighteen, early twenty nineteen. 
I nice. So uh, just quickly, I, managed, on the... I, I got started in that 2018 dip, if, if you don't recall. Um, I think it was not, not exactly at the bottom, but when it still hadn't fully recovered. So I, I found a good little market to buy into then. Uh, nice. I'm just going to quickly point out the ticker symbol at the bottom. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who has uh, supported the Passive Income Podcast by buying me a coffee. And I'm pointing this out because AJ is one of those people. So thank you so much for buying me a coffee and helping to support the Passive Income Podcast. Um, and you also mentioned CN Rail in there. I don't know if you've seen my train tweets. I, I send them out uh, semi-regularly because right outside that window over there, uh, mm -hmm. Just across the road, there is a CN Rail triple track. Yeah. And actually, just down the road from me, there's actually a, a CP Rail single track as well. So okay, cool. I'm right near the trains all the time, and they're going by all day, every day. And so I know Anthony, uh, at Newcomer Investor, is uh, uh, I, I tag him in in most of the tweets that I send out uh, with the with the trains. And yeah, he loves them. So I, I just wanted to, uh, to throw that in there as well. I, and I know you've been a guest on Anthony's channel as well. So yeah, well, I enjoyed doing that episode too, because we talked, uh, he was willing to do an episode where we just talked about all the things I want to talk about, which was value investing China. China is a, I mean, I, I invest broadly across Canada, the US, China, and even just some generic international index funds. But uh, I do like talking about China because it's a really interesting topic. Because it's like you've got these stocks that are so cheap. I mean, if they had been U.S. stocks at the same multiples and the same growth rates and everything, they'd be no brainers. But everybody's afraid about this potential war with Taiwan uh, between China and Taiwan. Right. So it, it gets complicated when you factor in the risks. But yeah. 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 So I guess moving forward, sort of what does your portfolio look like now? Well, I haven't actually broken down the weightings of everything uh, exactly. So the top three stocks, I can't tell you the specific order, number one, number two, number three, but That's it's fine. Google, Google and two bank stocks, um, uh, Bank of America and TD Bank. And then after that, you would have the DEU, uh, Vanguard FTSE All World XUS Index Fund. Um, then after that, Apple and then uh, Taiwan Semiconductor and Alibaba then PDD Holdings, which, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, is a, another Chinese e-commerce company similar to Alibaba, but much smaller and with vastly better growth. And other than that, I have a few other miscellaneous index funds. Like I have VFH, the Vanguard Financials Fund, and Chix, the uh, China Financials Index Fund. Interesting. So, Oh, and some SPY. I mean, I, VOO, actually, in my case, but... Right. I have a little bit of, uh, of of the VOO in there. I think it's maybe my sixth or seventh heaviest weighted position. Interesting. So you're really like focused on the global economy, the global market, you know, Canada. I'm know. definitely uh, overweight global stocks compared to most Canadians and Americans. Yeah. Which might not be the worst thing in the world, right? Yeah, the U.S. market in particular is very expensive right now, and um, expensive to us with our exchange rate. Yeah, yeah, and expensive in a valuation sense. I mean, the Nasdaq uh, is at I think it's about thirty-two times earnings now. Um, I mean, the not the company Nasdaq, the Nasdaq one hundred index, mm -hmm. and um, I'm except possibly Nvidia. I, I'm not seeing a whole lot from the big tech companies that's justifying that. I mean, I, I, lo I love Google and Apple. I mean, I'll, I'll be holding them for a while. But, um, you know, we had Meta Platforms run up to uh, 35 times earnings, I think it was recently. And uh, their, their, their most recent quarter triggered a rally um, to, uh, to 320 or so. And it was 7% in a day. But, I mean, if you look at uh, that growth they had in that quarter, it was 21% growth in earnings per share year over year. But you got to compare it to... 2021 they're still down from 2021 levels right. so um the old meta platforms growth story still hasn't quite returned in my opinion and it, it's much the same deal with the other tech companies i think yeah the big tech companies are obviously very interesting as far as like you mentioned uh meta apple google and we saw them all just what about six or eight months ago kind of really hit some some serious lows and a lot of people were really snapping them up thinking hey these aren't going to be at these lows forever 
And I know, like I said, in the last six or eight months, a lot of people, probably yourself included, have done fairly well on, on those. It was at those 2022 lows that I was buying Apple. I was taking things, uh, you know, new money I was depositing into my accounts, putting into largely Bank of America and Apple. Um, but, uh, and, and yeah, I think that was a good buy point. Uh, but yeah. I, I just, uh, these highs that we're seeing now, I find hard to justify. Right. And that's always the, the trick in it, the trick, right. Yeah. In, in investing is like, you know, buying at the lows and, and either selling yeah. or, or just continuing your conviction and holding at the highs and, and not buying more at the highs and just yeah. being like, okay, I'm happy here and we'll see where the, where the future takes us. Mm hmm yeah, for sure. I uh, also I've trimmed my U.S. I, not, I didn't exit, but I trimmed a little bit. I sold my Meta stock. I, uh, I I trimmed Apple and Google, and I sold QQQ. This was mostly within the last month or two. So, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you've probably done this correctly as far as Canadian investing in uh, U.S. companies where you have. Uh, you, the U.S. companies in an RRSP to yeah. avoid the fifteen percent yes. withholding tax. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But Go Simple Google's one an word exception. answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, Go Google's an exception. They don't pay a dividend, so I hold that across you know a, a whole bunch, three accounts, I believe. I hold Google across, but uh, for the most part, the dividend paying U.S. stocks, I try to keep them in the RRSP. Yeah, which makes and sense also low, also low yield ones like Apple. That's also in my TFSA because it's, I mean, it's what, a 50, 80%, 50%, I think, is what, and the, the dividends isn't a big part of that stock story, so. Right. Yeah, no, it's not. It's it, yeah. it's nice that they pay this little tiny dividend because it's something, it's a it's a nibble, I guess, but yeah. you're really not into Apple for the dividend for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And, and just for anyone... Uh, viewing and listening, uh, TFSA in Canada is a tax-free savings account. I've always said it probably should be called a tax-free investment account. And an RRSP is a, a registered retirement savings plan. And obviously, there are some different um, tax benefits uh, to both of those accounts, especially when investing in the U.S., as mentioned, using an RRSP account to uh, to not have the, the 15 percent withholding tax i there's obviously some type of deal there between canada and the u.s people smarter than me please explain in the comments <laughs> uh aj so uh what else do we have going on in in your portfolio you mentioned off the top how you've kind of become a little bit of a dividend investor by accident um i i, I guess maybe that was off the top with your high school portfolio does that still hold true to this day let me just go through this. All of my individual stocks, except Google, pay uh, pay dividends. And yeah, so you're just looking at these companies, saying, "Hey, these are good companies, and they happen to pay a dividend also." And by waiting, because the those two banks, TD and Bank of America, make up such a high percentage of my portfolio. I know that combined, they must be like thirty percent. Um, my overall portfolio yield is higher than. Uh, what the yield on the S&P 500 is, and probably even higher than the yield on the TSX. I, I think the TSX is around 3%-ish now, isn't it? And mine is probably a 3 point something, 3.2, 3.3, something like that. Interesting. Uh, so I guess a couple of things first on the on the banks, on the banking. You Obviously, you've mentioned TD several times. Mm -hmm. I have an extremely small position in TD. And when I say extremely small, I... I, I a few weeks ago or a month ago, I bought one share. So that's as small as it gets. Well, I, I did a right? similar thing. I bought one share in Bank of Montreal. And in fact, that was today. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I, which is a great segue, which leads into my my next topic of, yeah, all the other Canadian banks. We obviously, we, we know how strong they are. We know, like, they make $1.2 billion in prop per quarter or more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just your thoughts on, on the whole uh, banking sector primarily in Canada, but just the, 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 the bank sector overall. I've had past guests on K as well who are who invest in Barclays and, and Lloyds of London and other uh, banks that we don't think about a lot here in North America. Um, so, yeah, just your thoughts on... I was looking on, at on... HSBC. Um, okay, so um, the Canadian banks, the reason why uh, investors tend to like them 
is because Canada has relatively strict financial regulations that prevents them from doing anything stupid. But if you saw <laughs> um, in the uh, the U.S. regional banking crisis, um, you know some banks like First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank they had uh, runs on the bank. Uh, depositors started taking all their money out. And uh, at the same time as this was going on, they were not practicing very good uh, risk management. Like their liquidity ratios were very low. Their capital ratios were very low. And th these ratios, what they are is things like uh, liquidity ratios, for example, will tell you like a co uh, company's highly liquid assets compared to deposits. So in other words, how many assets, what, what the dollar amount is of assets they can convert into cash to cover those uh, withdrawals. And then capital ratios is like high quality capital equity, uh, things like um, cash and things like that go into that too, as a percentage of assets. That's making sure that the their asset mix is not too risky. And th the Canadian government has all kinds of regulations setting minimums for these for, uh, for Canadian banks. Uh, and they can get in trouble if they don't live up to them. So basically Canadian banks kind of have to practice risk management it's not optional for them. Um, in the U.S., they, uh, there is no official regulatory minimum uh, for, for, say, for example, the CET1 ratio. Um, the CET1 ratio is a measure of like really, really, really high quality capital to risk weighted assets, which means the assets are added up in such a way that uh, the, the riskier ones get a heavier weighting. Right. And uh, basically, that can be as low as 4.5% in the U.S. technically which is the minimum other the, under the Basel III Accord. Now, the Fed has its stress test where it tests these banks to see how well they do uh, in, in scenarios where there's a lot of uh, deposits or a lot of market volatility, a lot of deposit withdrawals or market volatility or things like that. But um, it's not really a firm regulatory requirement. Like if you fail the Fed's stress test, it's like, well, you failed it. You're not uh, yeah. you're not living up to some regulatory obligation. So the, the, the U.S. banks just aren't anywhere near as strictly regulated as Canadian banks. Also, with Canadian banks, there's the high barriers to entry. I mean, it's like we said earlier, it's very difficult to just just start up and start a bank in Canada. I mean, there's so many uh, regulations governing who can own it, and uh, you know what percent uh, percentage of the ownership has to be uh, Canadian, and what percentage of the ownership can be one individual shareholder. And plus, there's just all these regulations, so you need a huge compliance department. You're not going to get hundreds of people starting new banks in Canada, most likely. So that gives right. them kind of a competitive advantage. Um, and finally, because the Canadian banks have faced all of these regulations at the corporate level, when they expand into other markets like the U.S., all, their entire operation, even their U.S. operation, ultimately has to meet Canadian risk management standards. So this gives them an advantage when they're trying to expand during these periods where U.S. banks are failing because they're not really regulated, um, or at least not regulated enough. So uh, they've made a lot of headroads in the U.S. financial services market. Yeah, I sure. mean, TD, 40% uh, of TD's net income uh, comes comes from the U.S. And, yeah. uh, and it's probably going to grow because they just bought Cowan. They had the first Horizon deal shot down but they, they've pledged to make up for that by just opening new branches. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're going to continue to do pretty well for the most yeah. part. Yeah, whenever I think of TD in the U.S., the first thing that comes to mind is uh, like uh, Boston and TD Gardens. It's like when you're naming a stadium in the U.S. for a Canadian company, that's, that's pretty it's big the, deal. They're currently the ninth biggest bank in the U.S., so they're a major, major player. They're a major the player, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, switching gears, I, I definitely want to get your thoughts on on several different uh, sectors that we haven't talked about. Uh, you mentioned regulations and Canadian regulations, so I want to jump into telecoms. Obviously, we have like Bell, Talos, Rogers, and now uh, with that uh, acquisition from a few months ago, where where it became sort of clear that Quebecer slash Videotron was going to become a, the fourth major player in, in Canadian telecoms. And you didn't mention any of those as part of your portfolio. So I'm just wondering what you, what you don't like about the Canadian telecoms or what's keeping you away from them and just kind of your thoughts on, on that whole sector. Okay. So I, I just don't have that much expertise in telecoms. I mean, I, I like to really understand the uh, investments that I buy pretty well. I, I have written some Motley Fool articles about the telecoms though. And uh, 
for that reason, I, I have this vague suspicion that Rodgers is the strongest player in the space. They seem to be kind of doing relatively well. I mean, this is a year when a lot of telecoms in Canada and the U.S. are really getting uh, yeah. decimated. We, we've got AT&T down to like, what? Is that a penny stock yet? Or <laughs> I mean, it's, And it's had an 8% yield. And people are getting really excited because the trailing yield is on some of these U.S. telcos is like 8% now. If these businesses turn it around, you know, some people are going to be getting rich. But I, um, unfortunately, I just don't understand the industry well enough to make those bets. Right. Yeah. So my thoughts uh, quickly on the telecoms are, well, a few things is like, we all have cell phones these days, so they all have their mobility division. And so it's like, you know, 8 billion people on the planet and there's 10 billion cell phones, it seems, because everybody, has, not everybody, but a lot of people have a personal cell phone and a work cell phone. So it seems like there's more cell phones than people on the planet. Um, plus every kid, like down to, I don't know how old are kids getting cell phones these days, right? Like eight, nine, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And so it just seems to me like, you know, the telecoms are, are here to stay. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely something that I, I see my, like myself and everyone else paying that phone bill, that cell phone bill every single month. And to whether it's to Bell or Telus or to AT and T or Verizon or whoever you're paying that cell phone yeah. bill to, somebody's getting paid every month. Um, my kind of my follow up thought there is I I, I don't own any, any Telus, but I've been watching it now and it's been floating around a 52 week low for over a month now, and it's just like mm -hmm. and they kind of keep hitting new 52 week lows, and I'm thinking like how how long is that going to last before it just starts to rebound and should I get in before before the rebound happens? Right? Um, I don't know. I don't well, know. Well, <laughs> um, I will I will tell you this. I actually uh, gave a kind of tepid recommendation for uh, for Telus stock in a recent Seeking Alpha article. It, it wasn't really a recommendation, but it was a stock like th uh, three high yield uh, uh, dividend stocks. Right. And I, I described Telus as a stock with a high yield that could afford to keep paying the dividend. But my recommendation kind of ended there. I, I really don't know about enough about the telecom industry as a whole to say that the stock is a buy. But I, I was able to ascertain that um, their dividend yield is high and the payout ratio is and the er is low enough and the earnings stable enough uh, that they can probably at least continue paying the dividend, maybe raise it a little bit. But I, I, I was not confident enough in my knowledge about that stock to recommend it as, as a buy overall. Uh, full disclosure, I do invest into Bell, and I'm dollar cost averaging into Bell oh, okay. and trying to build that position. Uh, moving on to another sector that I want to touch on that you did not mention at all. And my viewers and listeners know how much I love my REITs. Um, mm -hmm. So thoughts on REITs, uh, thoughts on real estate in general, anything just... Right oh. now, I feel like I have an inkling that mortgage rates are probably good right now with, with the rates going up. And I mean, unlike banks, you know, banks are always worrying about the margins getting squeezed because deposit interest going up more than loan interest. But the mortgage rates, they lend money, but they don't have that problem that the banks have. So I think there could potentially be some good, uh, good opportunities in mortgage rates now. As for property rates, um, I, I, I like telcos. I don't, I don't under, understand the space all that much. I know the real estate market is slow right now. I don't think the U.S. market is seeing a vast decline in uh, property levels like we've seen here in Canada, although it's reversing now. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's a slower real estate market. I don't really know what I think. But I know that I, I find, uh, I think that mortgage rates right now are, are worth researching and looking into. But that's all I can say, because I haven't researched into yeah. enough to say decisively buy this mortgage rate. <laughs> no, and I appreciate that. Uh, definitely not financial advice. We're just two people having a conversation. Yeah. Um, but to your point, the property REITs are getting hammered because of those higher interest rates right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, But they're still paying the dividends. I've had, I think, two one recently cut the dividend within the last, I want to say, three or four months. And then one last fall, as the rates were going up, before the rates even got kind of high, there was another one that, that cut its dividend. Um, so, And obviously, dividend cuts hurt. We don't like them. We like dividend raises, but but that's mm -hmm. part of the game as well, right? So you, you, you take the good with yeah. the bad, kind of, kind of like you got to do it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, jumping into another sector that I want to get your thoughts on. Um, oil and gas, 
slash energy slash renewables. I, I, I know they're kind of different sectors, but you can kind of lump them all into one as well. So uh, any thoughts on any companies, uh, anything in there that uh, that you like, don't like, would invest yes. in, would so, um, check with a 10-foot pole, whatever, <laughs> go for it. Um, no oil and gas in my portfolio now, but I did play the uh, – the, the oil stocks in uh, in 2022, uh, early 2022. And uh, there I kind of broke with my usual investing philosophy because I didn't hold them very long. I, I had a few buys uh, ranging from a few weeks to a few months. And uh, whenever the oil prices would go up above $120, I always just felt that was getting overheated and, and I would sell. 120 so I, per barrel. 120, yeah. And um, I uh, WTI. Uh, I mean, our Canadian crude index uh, was probably bought at the peak mid '90s or something. But anyways, the ones I bought were Suncor and Occidental Petroleum. I had two Suncor buys that I held for a couple weeks, two months, made quick gains on, and exited. I had one Oxy buy that I lost a little bit of money on, and finally, I had another Oxy buy that I actually held probably for the greater part of the year, and I did make a, a little bit of profit on it. So overall, on my oil trades in 2022 i made a little bit of money um if you want to know what i think about oil now um my feeling is that oil prices will be relatively high for the next few years uh but not 2022 high i i, I find um these four, there was one of the investment banks came out with a forecast that uh oil prices could go up to 300 and uh that was a particularly uh, uh ambitious forecast but other and people in oil and gas twitter Back in 22, they were all adamant that oil was going to 200, 250. I never believed that. I, I always sold my oil stocks whenever the price would go over 120 because I felt like that was too high. But I do think right. that the prices we're going to see in the next few years are going to be better than the uh, 2014, 2015 period when it went way down to the 50s. Because yeah. the factors that contribute to it, look, I mean, oil, uh, gasoline consumption on a worldwide basis is still rising. I mean, people talk about the shift to renewables. And you've got countries like uh, Norway that are certainly pushing that heavily, but worldwide, I mean, it, it still tends to go up usually consumption right. by two or three percent a year. Um, second, OPEC is cutting, and uh, the reason why their cuts haven't had such an effect yet is because Russia was actually selling a lot of crude, um, and uh, also the this idea that Russian crude, the, the 2022 idea, and this is why oil prices ran up so much. People were locking in prices on oil. In the futures market because they believe that russian crude was going to be like was going to disappear from the market and we sure it was 120 crude but we would see 150 crude in another few months because russia is just not selling anything well the sanctions so, on russia because yeah. of the ukraine the war in ukraine and yeah and and they technically are severely sanctioned but it's all just going through china now i mean they they've upped their right. exports to china and then china goes and resells and in india Europe at a markup and uh, yeah you know so uh, that basically what's happening is at the the way the cards fell, uh, the Russian crew did keep getting out onto the market after all. So right. uh, so I don't see peak 2022 prices. I, I see relatively high for the 2013 to 2023. I don't see any slide back into the 50s. I, I don't even necessarily think we'll see low 60s, but let's say a range of 65 to 85 is where we could probably expect oil to be for the next few years. Disclaimer, I'm not the foremost expert uh, in oil and gas or anything like that, but I do have no. some experience uh, in oil and gas stocks, and I did make money off them, so take for that what you want. Yeah, I pre no, I appreciate your opinion and, and just uh, uh, speaking to I it. I certainly know more about oil and gas than I do about telcos. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, full disclosure, fair enough. Yeah. Oh, made me lose my train of thought there for a second. Uh, oh, sorry. Kind of sticking on that on that same topic, energy, and one of my, well, I, I've been kind of slacking. I, I've been trying to dollar cost average in this year to Hydro One, which is obviously the biggest uh, hydro provider here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious is is there like something similar in Nova Scotia or uh, Amera? What are your thoughts on it? Amera. Uh, uh, there's Fortis in. Newfoundland, which I think might have operations in Nova Scotia, but right. as far as uh, uh, the the eastern provinces go, I mean the, the go to utility stock is uh, is Fortis. Um, that's been a real popular uh, dividend. Uh, if they hike their dividend again in September, they'll become a dividend king. I've never owned it 
or any other utilities. But I've always, when I wrote about it, I always gave it good coverage. Yeah. No, I, I don't own any Fortis either, but definitely uh, a lot of positive reviews, a lot of positive uh, feedback in, in the DivTwit uh, yeah. community. So. Uh, and one final sector, well, there's so many, 11, 10 or 11 sectors, but another sector I want to kind of get your thoughts and opinions on. And again, I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of lump two sectors together because they're correlated is consumer staples and consumer discretionary. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, obviously, you, you, you know, you mentioned Coca-Cola off the top, but I'm thinking things like uh, here in Canada, things like pizza, pizza being consumer uh, discretionary or obviously you've got your consumer staples like the uh, Loblaws and Metro and uh, Sobeys Empire, I believe it's its mm -hmm. uh, corporate name is. And then obviously, again, the U.S. stocks, the Walmarts, the Costco's. Um, so any thoughts on anywhere in there, whether it's consumer staple, consumer discretionary? I don't own any of that at the moment, but I think some consumer uh, high consumer staples with high uh, brand recognition tend to be a uh, really good investments long term. Um, you've got like, for example, uh, Unilever in the UK, they own so many recognizable brands, have right. so much pricing power. I would actually, if, if I were going to get into uh, to consumer staples, I would buy uh, probably Unilever because the US ones and the I haven't looked at the Canadian ones, but the US ones are a bit expensive now. Yeah, you've got your Procter and Gamble um, versus Unilever yeah, are, are the two I, that you would I, really look at. I, I'd buy Unilever if I were to get into consumer staples, but um, it's fairly cheap. Um, not cheap, cheap, but fairly cheap. Right. And uh, the brands are just as good as Procter and Gamble's brands. Um, and then there's Kraft Heinz, which funnily enough, Warren Buffett actually lost money on that. But if you bought it cheaper, it, uh, it would have been good. And um, as far as uh, consumer discretionary goes, like um, I, I think luxury is a good industry. Like your uh, your LVMH stuff like that. Um, I don't own any again, but I, I think it's well, it's the definition of high mode. Like how many people can come out there and be like a fashion superstar that uh, uh, that has people wanting to pay a uh, ninety? What, what's the margin on, on high fashion anyways? Like ninety nine percent. You take a bit of fabric and you, right. you can sell a jacket for like three thousand bucks. The margins in that industry must be insane, but. Um, yeah, I'd, so I, I think uh, that's high quality brands in staples and discretionary are, are, are good. Great. Uh, great point. I'll, I'll tell you just quickly the reason why I really like uh, consumer staples and discretionary. And I don't own a lot of them. I do have some, like I mentioned, Pizza Pizza is one of my, uh, one of my favorites, is that people eat every single day, yes. <laughs> two or three times a day. So you know. And there's a that... limited amount of real estate to put restaurants into. So that's part of it too yeah there so i mean um a, li a limit to how much competition there can be right yeah so yeah you know that's just kind of my thoughts on on that whole sector and again like i said i'm kind of combining the two sectors of, of consumer staples and consumer discretionary people are going to spend money on food and on entertainment and on those like you said luxury yeah. items as well and I, I will say that unilever has been a, a serious consideration for me for some time Right. Got beaten uh, down with all that pessimism towards UK stocks. But if you look at where they sell their products, they sell the products everywhere. Everywhere. They sell them US, Asia. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, it's like if you go into uh, your bathroom or wherever in your, your laundry room in your house and you turn that package around, you're going to see either the Unilever logo or the Procter & Gamble logo. Yeah. Pretty much yeah, guaranteed. For sure. Those. And I, I've literally done that experiment uh, myself here at, at my house going, hmm. And yeah, those are the two. It's like, oh, this toothpaste is made by Procter and Gamble. Oh, this shampoo or this laundry detergent is made by Unilever, right? Like it's, yeah. it's here. <laughs> yep. Both great, gonna, uh, great, brand, great brands. I'm going to pull up your uh, Seeking Alpha here because we've okay, talked sure. about that a fair bit. Obviously, you are a significant contributor to Seeking Alpha. And obviously, I will put this link in the description below. So... Yeah, just quickly talk a little bit more, I guess, about your uh, your journey as a well. It says right in your your Twitter bio, bio a financial journalist. I, I think writer would be more appropriate because I'm not exactly writing breaking news, but it just seemed like as far as established 
job titles go, journalist is the closest to what I do. Right. But financial writer is probably a bit more accurate. But Yeah, and I see you have a lot of interaction here. You've got 281 analysis and 975 comments. And can somebody please give him one more like to get to 500? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, tons of uh, tons of stuff here to go through. And um, yeah, like I said, I will I will definitely put that link in the description below. And um, I was also going to bring up your quickly here. This one that should be on the screen now. No, it's not because I have to do this. There we go. Your Twitter handle at AJ Button. I uh, definitely Thanks give AJ a out. follow. Thank you. Thank you for the shout out. Yeah, I definitely give AJ a follow. Uh, tons of great tweets. Tons of uh, tons of great X's. I got to stop calling them tweets. We can't call them tweets anymore. I think they're calling them X eats or Zeets or I, I don't know how they're pronouncing it. But <laughs> I know, right? It's uh, it's so. Uh, I, all all we know is that it's not tweets anymore. We don't yeah. know what, whether it's Zeets or X eats or. Yeah. But it's either way, -E -E -E. Uh, either way, it's uh, at AJ button at AJ button two. two at AJ button two. Yes. On on Twitter on X. I don't know. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do you think Elon's going to pull this off? off? Just as a closing note, do you think Elon's going to pull it off with this X thing? Given it's just a total change of direction brand wise from uh, from everything that Twitter had going on, but. Yeah, so what I don't understand is the everything app. Yeah. Like, he's going to want to put everything into one app. Like, I mean, everything. Yeah. Everything? He's trying to do something like WeChat, like social media mixed with payments. No, I get that. But when you say everything, like, everything? <laughs> you can't. Yeah. You can't have, have everything. <laughs> Where would you put it? <laughs> but yeah, no, I. I Obviously, I'm the same as everyone else. Extremely uh, curious to see the direction that uh, Twitter slash X uh, goes or or becomes or, or takes now. So, Yeah, particularly now with Threads as a competitor. Well, so yes I, and I'm no. Sure. Threads like came in hot. Like they had 30 or 60 million subscribers or, uh, you know, new users in the first 48 hours. And now two weeks later, nobody talks about Threads. So... I still use it though. I, I, I mean, I, really? I, make, I make a point of having a presence on both. But if it dies completely, eventually I'll stop using it. But I, I've literally sent one thread I, when I created the account. I'm like, I guess I'm sending a thread now, and it got a yeah. bunch of likes and, and a bunch. It's of missing a lot of like, functionality though. Like, there's no, there's no DMs, yeah. there's no desktop app, there's no, uh, there's no, no Europe. comments. Yeah. Yeah. So. It was literally a you know a bunch of people followed me on Threads, but they were literally all the same people that just follow me and inter interact with me on Twitter yeah. anyway. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Awesome. Well, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. You're Truly welcome. appreciated this conversation. This has been awesome. Yeah, uh, I had a good time. Before we sign here. off, I had a good time. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, before we sign off, any closing thoughts or anything you'd like to say? Any any not financial advice but advice you'd give anyone just remember to take the long-term perspective and yeah. when you're buying buying aim to buy relatively cheaply yeah great uh great not financial advice <laughs> <laughs> and again like i said uh thank you so much for your time truly appreciated you coming on and spending uh some of your time with me here on the passive income podcast yeah, thank you thank you for having me yeah. And if you are still here 45, 44 minutes later, you know the rules. Uh, you just have to hit that subscribe button. Subscribe. <laughs>